Well, hello. Welcome to another episode. As you can see, I'm out here in the woods in the World War II foxhole that I built pretty much last week. Did the final touches to it this week, added a few more sandbags around the back and just compacted in a lot of this spoil up here just so the rain could run off really. Obviously, I'm looking slightly different to when I was last time. And that's because I did say to you, I would try and get some authentic World War II gear. And here I am wearing a few items, which I've managed to scour the internet for, uh, which I'm gonna go through with you in a minute because it's quite interesting, including some pretty old school, I mean, look at that, <laughs> weighs a ton. In fact, most of this gear weighs a ton, but yeah, it's, uh, it's awesome. I'm really pleased with the stuff I've got so far. It's not everything that I'd like, um, so I'm not fully authentic just yet. But remember, this is an ongoing process. This is an ongoing series. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting a few more items down the line, World War II items. Um, I'm gonna run through now what I've, what I've got, but before I do, I just wanna run through the shelter and where I'm at with it. <clears throat> so you can see, because I was just about to get a fire going, but I thought, you know what? Let's have a chat to the guys watching because they're gonna get annoyed that I'm not talking. So um, yeah, let me, let me just give you a tour. It's warm in this. This is my World War II inspired foxhole. Um, with an actual roof to it as well. Three different levels, the step, the middle section and the ground section. The kind of hole where there is a sump trench that is dug underneath so that if any water and rain when it runs down will get, won't puddle down there, it'll just run into the trench. Um, yeah, so use the 1965 entrenching tool to finish off the rest of this. Filled in more sandbags, but essentially that is the front. Uh, where I've got my raised bed as well, and I can use that as a bench when I sit down. If you'd like to see the previous episode, look up here in this corner or a link in the description below. Then you come around here. I've reinforced the back of the shelter with some more sandbags. It's pretty low profile. In fact, you can see like that, it's only, I don't know, 18, 20 inches above the ground, if that. So... Yeah, it's nice and low profile. This is totally enclosed, that bit. So essentially, if I were to fire an enemy, I'd like to think that, <laughs> I'd like to hope that they'd be coming from that direction and I could shoot out of that direction. And of course, this way as well. But um, yeah, I'm very pleased with it. A lot of effort, a lot of digging. But that's that. And then the steps just here. In there, that's the, the main entrance. And then down here, oh, there's a candle there. Let's get that up there. That's the sort of uh, first step, first level. I've just finished making this little lantern hanging device, bit of bushcraft to hang my lantern from. And I can slide that along anywhere there if I want to move the light wherever I want and hang it wherever I want along this front section. Uh, I'm going to have to boost the settings a bit, so apologies if it gets a bit blurry, but there we go. Just storing my firewood under here because it is forecasted to rain later, so keeping it dry. And there is my trench, and here's the roast bed. So that's the shelter. Okay, let's talk World War II gear. Start at the top. This is a Brody helmet, British Brody helmet, um, with a World War II lining. There is a date stamp on the inside. I'm really gutted though, and this is the thing with using old gear. The chin strap here was fully intact and it just snapped. I just pulled it a little bit to adjust it on my chin and it just snapped. Now it's repairable, but I'm gutted because it's now not in one piece, but that's the price I'm paying using the, the real gear from back then, the authentic gear. So this was a used helmet and is a used helmet by somebody in 1939, I think it is. So who knows, may have been used on the front lines. I'm guessing it certainly got use from the looks of it. Just there, so it's, you know, it's pretty, it's gonna be obvious when I now repair it and it's still the authentic chim strap, but I want to keep it that way. So I'm gonna stitch that. It's a Mark I Brody helmet and it does have a W on the front. I'm not sure what that means. Perhaps you guys might be able to inform me. Um, whether it was done by someone, a previous owner, or it means something. But um, yeah, this is, uh, there's the lining. 
Um, well, yeah, definitely well used. You can see from bits of rust and everything in it. And I'm not gonna lie, it's really not that comfortable to wear. It's um, it's just this, yeah, it's one size pretty much. So it's not really adjustable. So it does kind of crush my head. But um, for back then, I'm sure this was probably the latest technology. So it's interesting to see how far we've come since then. Uh, there's the date stamp and it says six and three quarters BMB 1 1939 Next up is the belt which I'm using to hold keep the, the trench coat in place. This is 1939 this belt and I'll just show you up close. So this is uh, an original World War II British Army Home Guard 1939 pattern leather belt uh, I think it's up to 36 weight, waist this and the leather although worn and a little bit stiff is actually way more supple than I thought which is why I wanted to wear it as a belt but it's got some serious character to this leather which is uh, which is awesome and uh, it was a bit fiddly to trying to get it adjusted but now I know I just wear this over the trench coat for the moment I'm not sure if you're meant to I'm pretty sure it's meant to go around your trousers obviously but it's just handy having it around the trench coat just for the moment to stop it moving around a lot. It has some markings here, S17 I think. But um, yeah, it's in pretty good nick to be fair. So I'm enjoying using that. So on to the trench coat. This is British officers 1944 used trench coat, uh, obviously an olive green and it's made of wool. I know that because it's very good quality it's very heavy and smells like Manan's attic. I was a little bit concerned about when I ordered it about the uh, size because I'm only a small guy and it's already a little bit long on the sleeves. But actually, this thing is so, so warm and today is an ideal time for it because we're five degrees, six degrees Celsius today. So this is perfect conditions. Any war, any hotter and I think it'd be a bit too warm. But this is the, uh, the British warm coat. So um, yeah, the warmer version. And I'm pleased with it. Two large pockets here on the side. Another pocket on the inside chest. Um, but it is, yeah, it's nice and warm. Next up, the backpack. So we just had some rain come over, hence the darkness on the camera. But this is essentially the British Commando P42 backpack from that era. It's beaten up. It's had some patches on it before that look like they've been removed. But boy, does that have some character. On the back, it's a very simple strap system. Literally, this is canvas, so it's heavy duty. Um, but I really like this hip belt. It's, it's, it's just a straight up piece of canvas. There is a curved frame at the back here, metal frame. Um, and actually that, just that simple piece of strap, which stops the backpack digging in, the frame digging into your hips, really makes it quite comfortable. So pleased with that. Um, yeah, very well used. I'll just open it up, show you what we've got. So it's what I'm sleeping in tonight, a blanket. This is not World War II, but it is a 100% wool, wool blanket. And then I've got a couple of mess tins for cooking in. There's another one somewhere. That one, yeah, another mess tin. I've got some water, which is in the foxhole. Uh, some gloves, some cheese and some tin food because what they ate back then was mostly rations and tin food and things like that so cheeses tin food oatmeal biscuits that sort of stuff uh, and some gloves as well uh, so the gloves this is pretty cool they are actually british military i think these are unissued ones but they are sniper gloves check this out so the thumb and the forefinger a separate and then you've got like a mitten over the other three fingers and that then means you can hold the stock of your sniper rifle with these three fingers and then you've obviously got your trigger finger free and your thumb free to pull the trigger very cool very ET phone home but an alien looking or Spock but awesome really cool so got to, got a pair of those um, to be honest they're not majorly warm they don't feel majorly warm but for the uh conditions that we have today pretty pleased right 
It's getting dark and the rain is coming. I think it's time to get some scran on. So this is pretty cool. For those wondering if it stays dry under there, if you look just here, here's the wet where it's been raining. It definitely does stay pretty dry, which is why I put my firewood under there. Good to know. So sticking with roughly the theme of rationing feed and fairly simple food, I've just gone for spam and cheese. Obviously there's no uh, bullied beef or corned beef, but um, spam's just as good. Very simple, easy dish. I've fired up the light now because it's starting to get dark. Cheers. Mmm.
Nothing like burnt spam in a mess tin. Can't beat it. This was another thing I put in the side pouch of the backpack. So Billy Cam. Um, the cook setup is not World War II. It's one of the grills, the adjustable um, <clears throat> mini anchor or pocket anchor, I think it is. Fire anchor, TJM Metalworks. Yeah, so just, you know, I'm getting there, guys. I'm getting there with the World War II stuff and the going all out um, authentic. But at the moment, I can't do it straight away. I'm just building up to it. What do you guys think of this type of episode? Something very, very different to what I normally do. Uh, personally, I'm loving it because, I don't know, it gives me some sort of... Um, what's the word? It just uh, helps me remember and appreciate what the sacrifices they made back in World War II and World War One. i I'm knocking the, the spam and cheese, but really I'm sure back then Certainly if they were in a foxhole, waiting enemy fire or just, yeah, waiting it out. I'm sure it was a bit, you know, a bit of a godsend really, food like that, just to have any sort of food. I can't imagine there was much time to eat when they were out on the front lines. I'm using all this heavy old school gear, just, it does make you appreciate how easy we've got it now with all the lightweight stuff and just easy, easy things now we've got. So much easier. Ham and cheese, eh? Spees. Had some biscuits earlier as well. I've really brought limited food with me because that's the whole point of this overnighter. Is to try and eat like they did, really. Keep it simple. Time for bed set up. It's going to be quite uncomfortable tonight because I've not. So I'm going a bit more authentic. I've not got obviously a sleeping pad or anything to sleep on. Just the wool blanket. I'm going to sleep. I'm going to sleep in the trench coat because it's lovely and warm. It's basically like wearing a wool blanket anyway. Head that end, feet this end. Oh. It's cosy. Got my lantern here. Well, this is me, folks. Obviously, I'm not going to sleep in that. Mm, put that under the shelter. Oh, it fits under the bed. Perfect. Let's give this bed a go. Double wool. Oh. Oh. I'll tell you what, it is warmer down here where there's no airflow because I'm below the ground. I know that sounds odd because normally if you're below the ground it's like a hollow and it gets cold but I don't know maybe it's the heat from the lantern radiating. Strange. I've never slept in something like this before. Oh. I'm gonna call it a night folks. Thank you for watching if you've been watching this far. I appreciate it. We shall see what the morrow brings. It's due to drop down to about three degrees, so it's gonna be chilly. That's Celsius. Ugh. Good night.
morning folks. Just cooking up some breakfast of simple beans. And boiling some water for a tea. Did not sleep great. Had to adjust some of the logs in the bed, I'll show you in a minute. But that was inevitable given I didn't have a sleeping pad to sleep on. If you've ever slept on a raised bed without a pad, you would know. You don't get a good night's sleep. It's part of the reason I love this uh, cooking setup, this fire anchor, because, for example, actually it works really well with the mess tinks, it's got a long handle, but uh, normally you have to stir, stir it over the heat and it can, you can burn your hand and it gets hot, but I can just move it out of the way, stir it, and then just put it back over the flames. And obviously the, the billy can's boiling at the moment, so it's just a really good minimal setup that I do like using. Now I've actually packed up the blanket, I just thought I'd explain what I did halfway through the night. So I had these bigger logs in the middle, and if ever you've slept on a raised bed like this with no flat cover, it's very uncomfortable with no bowels on it or no pad, sleeping pad. It can be very uncomfortable, but what I tend to do when I've done it before, and I don't do it often, is any of the bigger logs I tend to put to the sides, and so it creates this kind of small hollow bowl almost. And it just helps, personally for me, it helps my back a little bit more. Because if you have these big ones in the middle, it just creates a ridge. And that just digs into the spine and it ends up being really uncomfortable. So I tend to create a little hollow like that. Obviously I was sleeping in a trench coat, which is nice, nice and thick. As well as the wool blanket as well. But just a, a little tip for those of you that do. One of the other things I didn't mention yesterday was this compass. This is Dad's compass. He actually gave me this for this episode. Um... He, told, he tells me it's from the World War II era. It's got this little button here, so if you release it, the compass can float freely. If you can see that, hopefully you can see it's sort of kind of floating freely in, I guess, alcohol spirit. Um, and then when you go to move, and if you drop it, obviously that's it's quite fragile, so you can pull this little button there, and it locks it, which is, uh, which is pretty cool. And it's got, I mean, I've not properly looked at it yet, but little adjustments here. It's got a lever here for sighting your compass, you fold it up, and it's, yeah, I mean it looks awesome. That slides up and down, I believe that's what locks it as you push down, that clicks into place. Very cool. The only markings we've managed to find on it are on the base here, you can't really see, but it basically says, it's almost like Roman numerals, 11XXX, so maybe you guys know about that, I don't really know. Personally, I, I really like the authenticness of it, and it works. It does point north, which is the main thing. Well, that's it from me and the foxhole. I've really enjoyed this World War II themed overnight. Like I say, I'm getting there with the gear. I'm not fully equipped yet and fully loaded out with World War II gear, but hopefully I'll get there and maybe with some suggestions from you guys on uh, where I can get different items. I'm looking at kind of camp stoves and things like that as well. But um, yeah, if you guys have any suggestions, pop them in the comments below. And that leaves only one more thing to do for this episode. We will remember them. <laughs>